I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, let's see if we can do this again, ladles and jelly spoons. Hopefully the internet will treat us kindly. My name is Paige, here's my coffee, and we're going to go into a new book of the Bible. The letter Paul wrote to one of his uh, converts, Titus. So we're going to be looking at chapter 1 of Titus today. Let's see here. Please let me know if uh, this is coming through fine. I'm... Uh, get my camera adjusted right there. If it's breaking up, let me know. We will take action accordingly. All right, let's get started. Titus. Titus was Paul's child in the faith. He tells us that in his opening paragraph. Who, according to Titus, had been left as Paul's representative in Crete to straighten out what was unfinished and to appoint elders in every town. Titus is unmentioned in the book of Acts. But you find him in Galatians, and he accompanied Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem to help prove that Gentiles could receive the gospel. He was an uncircumcised Gentile. Uh, he's mentioned again all throughout 2 Corinthians and in 2 Timothy. So he was a real person, and he was left behind by Paul in Crete. Now located south of Greece, Crete is the fourth largest island in the Mediterranean. All right, you see up here in the map, you see Corinth, and then you see Crete just down and slightly to the right. Um, just west of Ephesus, it's the fourth largest island in the Mediterranean. However, by Paul's time, the Cretans had a very poor reputation, so that even one of their own countrymen said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. Now, Paul's ship off, stopped at Crete on route to Rome to his first imprisonment, and a possible reference to Cretans may be found in 1 Samuel. It's, it's possible that the Phoenicians, that this was a Phoenician nation or Phoenician uh, uh, settlement, if you will, um, and the Phoenicians were oftentimes opponents and uh, uh, of Israel. So, there we go. Now, Titus, he is a pastoral leader whom Paul assigned to put things in order on the island of Crete. He and Paul worked together for over a decade uh, prior to that, and Paul writes perhaps in the early 1860s after release from his first imprisonment. So he's out of his first imprisonment with Rome, he's writing to Titus. Titus has been left behind to straighten things up and get things settled. Nicopolis uh, was on the west coast of the province of Epirus in central Greece, Paul was on his way there when he writes this, perhaps. Now, the message of Titus takes shape against a unique social background. Now, I'm reading a commentary uh, that I've got for this. Cretan culture was widely regarded as disorderly and rife with dishonesty. They were known for that. The prominent mythical god Zeus allegedly was born and died on Crete earning divine status by his generosity to humans. Some passages in Titus take on sharper meaning when you keep that myth in mind, because Zeus worship was a very big deal on Crete, and so Paul wants to set the Christian gospel and Messiah in sharp contrast to what people thought about Zeus. Chapter 1. Paul a servant of God, an apostle, and an apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which now at his appointed season he has brought to light through the teaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior, to Titus, my true son, in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior." Now, it's interesting, his, 
it's a typical introduction. Paul identifies himself and he identifies the recipient. Paul's a writer, the recipient's Titus. But he does something a little bit different here from his other letters, and he puts all this stuff in the middle. Um, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness and the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, see, that would put it in contrast to Zeus. Zeus lied. Greek, it was a common thing for Greek and Roman gods to be very fickle and lie when it was to their advantage. And they were always tricking humans to do this thing or that thing. So Paul is right away setting this up to Titus and to anybody else who reads this letter that our God is not like the Zeus. That was the big deal on Crete. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. As An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children are believers, and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Now, this is a stripped-down version of what Paul talked about in his letter to Timothy, about what an elder or an overseer must be like. A um, couple things here. Again, as in Timothy, in order for someone to be considered an elder or an overseer, the qualities that are mentioned here are things that have to be observed over time. This is not fly into town, find somebody who looks responsible, appoint him as an elder, fly out of town to the next church. Now, these men who will be the elders and overseers of these churches these are things that can only be observed over time. Um, you, you have to be able to observe his relationship with his family over time to see, are his children obedient? Do his children believe? Are they wild? Um, you have to be around long enough to see, is he faithful to his wife? Or is he like much of the culture that uh, would just turn, turn into a uh, a blind eye or just a wink at somebody who had uh, a mistress on the side. Um, what's the deal? So, again, to be an elder and an overseer is not a hasty thing. That's why most elders were of older age. And I say most because there are some that weren't, obviously, but most were of older age because it you have to look at the sum of their lives to see what kind of lives they're leading. Are they solid? Do they understand the word? Are they? Do they have a good relationship with their wife? Are their children disobedient? Um, is he even-tempered? Is he not overbearing? Is he given to drunkenness? Is he violent? Does he pursue dishonest gain? These are all the things that you have to take time to observe. And these are all the attributes of an elder. Now, another thought here. Um when it says an elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe, not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient, not overbearing, not quick temper, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Think about that with the backdrop of what was said about Cretans normally. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. That was their reputation. So the man of God who's going to be an elder or an overseer must be the antithesis of this Cretan proverb. Now, an elder, and here's another thought. I hadn't even given thought to this. Paul uses two terms, elder and overseer, and by and large, they're interchangeable. Um, but a thought in one of the commentaries I read led to uh, an elder might stress experience and mature wisdom. And an overseer may point to administrative and leadership responsibilities. I kind of think when he mentions elders and overseers, the terms are interchangeable, but their basic meanings of those words point to what we just said here. An elder, experience and mature wisdom. Overseer, administrator. You know, in many churches today, we see that. We see uh, 
in the my tradition, the Baptist tradition that I that uh, the churches I go to, we have an overseer, a pastor, a senior pastor. But then we always seem to have an administrator, an administrative pastor, a pastor whose gifts are keeping things running, keeping the cogs well oiled, and uh, making sure that the functions of the church are moving forward as they should, where the senior pastor is primarily responsible for the teaching and preaching ministries of this church. So you can see a case for both here. He goes on to talk about the elder. He says he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Sound doctrine. Paul's big on this. When he's talking about sound doctrine, he's talking about the apostolic teachings. And the apostolic teachings have been summarized in that document that I read before every one of my uh, uh, devotionals, the Apostles' Creed. This is the summary of what was taught by the apostles. God the Father, he's creator of heaven and earth. Jesus Christ, his son, our Lord, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, buried, third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. That's a summary of the Apostles' uh, doctrine. They call it the Apostles' Creed. And that creed was developed as a primary uh, point of delineation to separate the sound doctrine of the church from the heresies that were being brought forth by many teachers of the day. So he must hold firm to the trust with the message as it has been taught, so he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. For there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. I emphasize that here. Um, circumcision group are, are adherents to Judaism, they may or may not have been original converts to Christianity who wanted to maintain their exclusive Jewish nature because uh, Christianity, which, by the way, wasn't called Christianity at the time. Uh, it was just called, I think it was called The Way. It was birthed out of Judaism. Messiah, Jesus, was Jewish. Christianity... Our faith, our faith's mother, if you will, <laughs> is Judaism. And there were many Jewish converts that tried very hard to hang on to Jewish, all the Jewish customs. They saw, they saw what Jesus, they saw Jesus as a reformer of Judaism, that Judaism was still the true faith, and Jesus was a reformer of Judaism. What they had a hard time with was the fact that Gentiles could be accepted and grafted into this family without having to be circumcised, without having to fall, follow all the 613 uh, laws in the, in the Old Testament, that Jew, Gentiles could become believers without having to become uh, adherents to Judaism. These were the Ju Judaizers, the circumcision group. Paul says the circumcision group must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Now, one other thought here that I discovered while I was preparing for this, that there was a community of Jewish people on Crete, and Rome, in the beginning, had noticed that some of the most faithful supporters of Rome were the Jews. And so they gave the Jews a very special dispensation and protection um, for their faith. And so there was, a, there was a community of Jews on Crete. Uh, and Paul is telling Titus, the Judaizers that are coming out of this group, they have to be silenced. And they're disrupting whole households, teaching them things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. 
So apparently they were making money at this too, which wasn't an uncommon thing back then. Professional speakers would always come into town and get money for giving speeches and talking about things. One of Crete's own prophets said it. Cretans are liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. The saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to merely human commands of those who reject the truth. Now, Paul might be referring to Isaiah here. where In Isaiah 29, 13, it says, Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. The 400 silent years between the last prophet of the Old Testament, I believe it's Micah or Malachi. Oh, thinking off shooting from the hip here. Uh, to the time of John the Baptist, the onset of John the Baptist. It's called the 400 silent years. During those 400 silent years, God did not appear. No angelic visitations, no theophanies, no prophets, no prophetesses. Quiet. Well, in that 400 years, the religious community of Israel stayed busy. And their busyness consisted of them interpreting, reinterpreting, applying, and reapplying all that that had come before, all the laws. And they came up with more laws to explain the laws that God had given. It was kind of like, uh, let's say what the original law was, thou shalt not let thy child touch the burner on the stove lest its hand be burnt. Say that was the law. Well, then they would come up with a hedge around that law. They say, you know what? Let's say, don't let the child get within six feet of the stove so that its hand won't touch it and burn it and get burned. Then somebody else come along a little later and says, you know, he could be six feet away from the stove, but if he trips, stumbles and falls and puts his hands out, it could land on the burner and get burned. I tell you what, let's say, he shouldn't get any closer than 12 feet. Then someone else comes along and says, you know, he could trip, stumble, and roll, bump his head, reach up to grab the stove to pull himself up and burn his hand to the burner. You know what? Let's just say, stay out of the kitchen. All children should stay out of the kitchen. All right, now the original law was, don't touch the burner, lest you be burned. They end up with, children should stay out of the kitchen. As good intention as their intentions were, but you can see how the law, the original law, could get distorted. And in Jesus' time, Jesus continually rebuked the religious leaders for just that kind of thing. So rebuke them sharply, Titus, so they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to merely human commands of those who reject the truth. Believers do not need human commands. Now, this possibly involved also like Jewish food laws uh, because Jesus Jesus also directed his attention to stuff like that. Just foolish laws that really in and of themselves had no t real truth behind it. It just became truth by repetition and use, but it doesn't mean it was true. You know, it's, it's kind of like uh, if you do something long enough, it becomes fact. It becomes truth. There's a story about a um, a daughter watching her mama make a roast. And her mom always cut off an inch or so at each end of the roast, put it in the pan and cooked it. And the daughter asked the mom, why do you always cut off an inch of meat at either end of the roast? She said, oh, that's the way my mama did it. So when grandma came one day, the daughter asked her and says, um, why does mama cut off the ends of the roast? She says she did it because you did it. Why did you do it? She says, oh, that's easy. I learned it from my mother. And the reason my mother did it was because they were very, very, very poor and they didn't have a pan big enough to hold the roast to feed the whole family. So she would always cut the ends of the roast off so that the roast would fit in the pan. Something that was practical at one time just became uh, a custom and something that you just did because somebody else did it. That's what a lot of these Jewish rules and human commands were. So Paul is telling Titus, 
instruct them so they pay no attention to Jewish myths or merely human commands. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and don't believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. Hmm. Do you, sounds something like what James would say. Those who consider themselves religious and yet don't keep a tight rein in their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. James 2 says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Hmm. Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, ah, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds. I'll show you my faith by my deeds. Paul finishes his chapter by saying these people that claim to know God, they're detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. There's a passage in Matthew where Jesus is talking about the end of the, the end of the days where people are standing in front of him and they'll say, Lord, but we did all these things in your name. We prophesied in your name and, and things like that. And he says, I never knew you. Depart from me. I, I never knew you. There are people who claim to know God and have all these fancy teachings persuasive words. And if it were possible, they would they would absolutely confuse you. And the only way you can discern who is correct and who isn't is to look at their life. Uh, they claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. Now, what would the actions be? Well, I think probably we could look at what he talks about uh, elders. Is a man blameless? Is he faithful to his wife? How are his children acting? Um, is he given to drunkenness? Is he quick-tempered? Is he overbearing? Is he violent? Does he pursue dishonest gain? Is he hospitable? He loves what's good. Is he self-controlled? Is he upright? Is he holy? Is he disciplined? All these things, those are the actions of a godly man. In opposition to that, you could flip those around and that would give you the actions of an ungodly man. No matter what they say, look at their life. And depending on how their life stacks up, then you can choose to trust them or not.